Let us kneel and begin with a Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, St. Francis of Paola. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We are now living in a time of serious moral and spiritual crisis, and the whole world is in conflict and turmoil. Now, the church, who is the beacon and structure of morality for the world, is itself living through a time of a great apostasy, if not the great apostasy of her very leaders. Now, those that are supposed to be defending the faith and the church are not acting as guardians and protectors, but as wolves and predators among the sheep corrupting the faith of these little ones and throwing them to the dogs. Besides all this, we're witnessing heresy and schism, and the charity of many has begun to grow cold. The church and the world are in serious danger, as Our Lady has seriously warned us at Fatima. But in time of crisis, God raises great saints to strengthen our faith and the church, God loves us, and he will not abandon us. We have to remember this. Now, in 1416, the world was living in a time of turmoil. The Catholic Church was living through an embarrassing confusion known as the Great Western Schism. Now, there were three people claiming to be Pope. Gregory XII, the legitimate Pope in Rome, Benedict XIII in Avignon, and John XXIII, elected by a group of dissident cardinals at an illegal council held in Pisa. Now, God willed that during this crisis in 1416, a great saint was raised up to strengthen the church and our faith. Now, this saint entered the world in a time of great crisis of faith, and God chose him as a means to strengthen the weakening faith of many. Now, the saint's parents, Giacomo and Vienna D'Alessio, were deeply religious and devout and wholly devoted to St. Francis of Assisi. Now, although they were married for 16 years, they had no children. So they prayed to St. Francis, their most beloved saint, for his son, not for themselves, but to serve God. Now, they prayed that if St. Francis granted them a son, that they would serve his order and they would name him Francis. So on March 27, 1416, in a small town of Paola in northeast Italy, little Francis was born. He would become known as St. Francis of Paola. Now, a month after his birth, his mother had found an abscess in his left eye. So the doctors of the village told her that he would become blind in his future life. So Vienna D'Alessio, his mom, ran to a nearby church and placed little Francis at the foot of the altar of St. Francis of Assisi, his true patron saint. And with tears streaming down her face, she asked Francis to free her child from this abscess. She promised that if he was cured, that he would serve one year in the Franciscan monastery of St. Mark, wearing the Franciscan habit and living the holy rule of the order. And a few days later, he was miraculously cured. But then on March 27, 1429, the day that Francis turned 13, he woke up in his bedroom, finding it completely filled with light. Now, St. Francis appeared there at the foot of his bed, and he told little Francis, he said, Tell your parents that the time has come for you to wear the habit of the friar's minor. For one year, as your mother promised, when as a baby you were cured from an abscess in your left eye. So immediately he ran to his parents. He told his parents, and they consented right away. So Francis went off to the monastery with so much enthusiasm and zeal to follow the holy rule. Now, at the monastery, he learned to read, and he laid the foundation for a very austere and holy life, which he never abandoned for the rest of his life. From that day forward, he never slept on bedsheets, and he never ate meat again. While he was in the monastery, he had to be reprimanded every once in a while because of his severe fasting and for not getting enough sleep, all of which, of course, St. Francis did obey Now, at age 15, after he had left the monastery, 
He got his parents' consent to go to a rocky cave on the seacoast to live as a hermit. Now, during this time, he only ate bitter herbs and food brought to him by the people who lived nearby, and he slept on the rocks. When he was 20 years old, two men came out to join him. And not long after this, the townspeople of Calabria nearby invited him to their town, building three cells for them and also a chapel for the community. As the people started to learn more and more about the holiness of Francis, he began receiving many visitors and soon many vocations. The habit that they took in their order was very simple and made of coarse material. They slept on the floor or on wooden boards. They ate only fruit and vegetables. They used a rock for their pillow. But Francis himself would eat only one meal a day, and that was bread and water in the evening. And on great feast days, he would fast for two days straight, not eating anything for two days. Now, in his community, they lived a perpetual Lent. That is, they fasted the entire year. They did this in reparation for all the abuses of Lent, for people not following their resolutions, because he hated to see that fasts were lessened by the church, that people broke their resolutions for penance, and the weakening that this was doing to the world, and the lukewarmness that it was leading Catholics into. Now, the local bishop was so edified by their example that he gave this little community his approval, and so they began to build a larger monastery for all the vocations that God was sending them. Now, St. Francis began working many miracles because he had a great faith and confidence in the power of God. Now, one day while they were building the monastery, they were bringing in logs to place on the roof of the chapel, and they were putting these beams on the roof when all of a sudden one of the logs slipped It fell and it crushed one of the workers, whose name was Domenico, and it killed him instantly. Now, the other workers seeing this, they ran out to St. Francis and called in the saint. Francis came in and knelt by the mutilated corpse. Then he looked up to heaven. He raised his arms and said, In the name of charity, Domenico, arise. Domenico stood up, dusted himself off, thanked the saint, and then went back to work. Now, St. Francis also battled the devil one-on-one. He freed many from demonic possession. Now, one day a woman was brought to him kicking and screaming. This is my enemy, she yelled out at the sight of Francis. Now, Francis greeted her. Then he went to his cell, and he spent the whole night in prayer and in penance, asking for this woman's deliverance. Then he came out the next morning, and they brought the woman to him. She kept screaming, I have no fear of any of you. The only one that I fear is Fra Francesco. So Francis approached her very calmly and commanded the demon, I command you in the name of God on high to leave the body of this poor creature. The evil spirit returned with a lie. He said, you're in error. I'm not a demon. I'm a spirit of a venal woman who died 25 years ago. Well, knowing this was a lie, St. Francis commanded, Be silent and obey the name of the Creator. The enraged demon threw the woman's body on the ground, and she began to convulse until she fainted. Then a few minutes later, she stood up, completely free from the possession of this demon. Now, all of Francis' miracles became well known throughout all of Italy. In fact, many other regions of Italy began asking his religious community, the religious order of Minim Friars, to establish monasteries in their towns and villages. So in 1464, when Francis was 48 years old, He headed out to Sicily for a visit to establish a monastery, and he took two friars with him. Now, when they arrived at the ferry to cross part of the Mediterranean to Sicily, St. Francis saluted the captain of the ferry, whose name was Pietro Coloso, and asked him in a humble voice if, for the love of Jesus Christ, he would kindly transport him and the two brothers across to the Sicilian shores. But Coloso responded, I will be glad to, just as long as you pay me. But Francis said, But we, dear brother, are asking for your charity because we have no money. What does that mean to me, responded Coloso, coldly. If you don't have money to pay me, then you have no boat to carry you. So the saint, without anger or impatience, walked a little ways down the beach, knelt on the sand in prayer for a few seconds. Then he got up and he spread his mantle on the water. Then he picked up one end of the mantle with his staff He held it up in the air like a sail and began to sail across the four-mile stretch to Sicily. 
Now, of course, this freaked out the captain and everybody that was watching. They saw this great miracle. And so the Colosso, the captain, hurried the brothers onto the ferry and went after Francis. He shouted to Francis that he would ferry him across for free. But, of course, Francis continued undisturbed until he arrived in Sicily. Now, when the captain arrived, he went immediately over to Francis and begged his forgiveness. Now, after arriving in Sicily, the three fires walked down to Milazzo in northern Sicily, which is another town, and here they were going to stay for some time while they built their monastery. Now, they arrived at a place called the Pond of the Hang, and as they found a body dangling from the gallows, which had been hanged for three days before, they stopped, and Francis went up and retrieved the body. Now, the saint was so full of pity that he removed the rope from the dead man's neck, and with the help of Brother John, who was with him, he held him in his arms. He looked up to heaven, and he said a prayer, and the hangman sprang to life. The revived criminal fell to his knees, thanking the saint. He asked Francis that after saving his body, he might also help him save his soul, and so he asked him to make him a member of the order. The hangman whose name is unknown even till today, was admitted into the order, and he lived a holy life, and afterwards he died a holy death. Now, he did all this for the greater good of souls. He didn't do it for himself, and he did it for God, but he did it to strengthen the world's understanding of the power of the omnipotent God. Now, after three years in Sicily, doing all these works and miracles, he completed the monastery there, and then he returned to the monastery in Calabria. Now, one day in the town of Paterno, just outside of Calabria, where Francis was building another monastery, a farmer named Bernardino Pugalio was setting fire to a stand of trees and shrubs to clear his land to cultivate it. Then a strong wind came up and spread the fire to the connecting fields and threatened to burn the stacks of lumber that St. Francis had reserved for the monastery. Now this fire got out of control, and just then Francis ran out to see the flames, so he commanded the fire. He said, fire in the name of charity, but what are you supposed to burn? Do not touch what is mine. Pugliano, who saw all of this, said the fires died down and continued to burn only his stack. The saint's lumber was completely untouched. Now these are great miracles of the saint. And during all of this, St. Francis never suffered from pride because he gave all the credit to God and his only desire was to glorify God. He chose to always be the least in the community. And because of this, he never became a priest. Now, Pope Sixtus V had a great admiration for St. Francis and his congregation. So he offered Francis to ordain him a priest. Now, in spite of the fact that he had no schooling and many clerics thought him to be uneducated, he still asked St. Francis. Now, the Pope pointed out to his critics, he said, that he himself was self-taught, and he was so completely and fully dedicated to God, he pointed to his austerity and self-mortification, to prayer, to his prophecy and performing of miracles, and that this would more than fulfill his duties to be a good priest. Now, the Pope's request, of course, shocked Francis so bad that he dropped to his knees, and with tears in his eyes, he begged him to recognize his lack of dignity and his ignorance and to let him be what he always wanted to be, the very least of the whole community. Pope Sixtus, surprised but edified by his plea, took back his offer. But he did give him the power to bless rosaries, candles, medals, and other religious objects and sacramentals. The saint accepted these powers willingly, and he became a great apostle of sacramentals, especially of blessed candles, which he continued to do even though he wasn't a priest. Now, when the Turks began invading Sicily, one of Calabria's most trusted captains, Gian Nicola Conclubet, the Count of Arena, stopped with the soldiers to get Francis' blessing. Now, this Count was a brave, virtuous, and a holy soldier who loved his men and desired their salvation, and Francis knew this. So he went out to bless his troops and promised to pray for their success. Then he gave each soldier a candle that he himself had blessed. Then he said, Dear Count, go with fear and with the grace of God. You will fight with great valor against the enemies of your faith. Victory will be yours, and you and your soldiers shall return safely to your homes. Now one of the soldiers refused to accept the candle, saying that he didn't believe in religious articles. 
No, all the other soldiers accepted this offering with humility. Now after the battle, all of the soldiers returned home safely, except for the one who refused to accept the blessed candle. Now these are all great miracles in the life of St. Francis of Piola, but these aren't all of them. In fact, we will finish the life of St. Francis of Piola next time, because there's so much in his life which serves to strengthen our faith in this time of crisis. Now, even in these two weeks, we'll not be able to cover all of his miracles and all of his virtues, since there's not enough time. This saint is God's miracle worker. He was raised by him to strengthen a weakened world and a weakened church damaged by the great Western schism and a grave moral crisis at the time. This saint is necessary now to strengthen our faith in this time of great crisis in this world and in the church and to show us the power and omnipotence of Almighty God at the hands of a humble servant. His life is proof of the gospel that if we had the faith of a mustard seed, we shall move mountains. The author and researcher of his life, Mario Segretti, says this. He says, We find in Francis' life no evidence during his 91 years on earth that God denied this devoted son anything for which he had prayed. God so loved this humble servant that whatever Francis asked of him, the Almighty granted. God is calling up saints like St. Francis of Piola in this time of crisis. Will you be one of them? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Let us kneel and begin with the Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Our Lady, seat of wisdom, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. This is the second part of a two-part sermon on the life of St. Francis of Paola. So we'll do a quick review from last time. Now, it's not hard to see that we're living right now in a time of serious moral, and spiritual crisis. Now, the church has always been the beacon and the structure of morality for the world, but those that are supposed to be defending the faith and the church are not acting as guardians and protectors. Instead, they're acting as wolves and predators among the sheep, corrupting the faith of the little ones. But where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. In this time of crisis, God raises great saints to strengthen the faith in the church. God loves us, And he doesn't abandon us. We have to remember this. Now, as we recall from last time, in 1416, the year St. Francis of Paola was born, the world was living in a time of turmoil. The Catholic Church was living through the great Western schism. Now, during that time, God willed to raise up a great saint to strengthen the church. Now, the example of this saint serves us now to strengthen our faith today as we are suffering this great crisis of faith and living through this great apostasy. Now, the example of St. Francis helps us to see what one holy man, armed with the power of God, can do. God so loved this humble servant that whatever Francis asked of him, the Almighty granted him. God is looking for saints who are willing to be humble and filled with faith like St. Francis. Now, from last time we saw the many miracles, or the many great miracles of St. Francis, But in all these miracles, there was always a lesson to be learned. Now, this is how we can give glory to God, by putting the lessons of these miracles into practice. So, for example, one of the miracles. There was one time that a woman named Marinella went up to St. Francis and fell on her knees, asking for a cure for her daughter. Now, her daughter's body had been completely covered with sores. Now, Francis had never met her, but he revealed to her something that she didn't realize that he knew. He said, if you really want God to cure your daughter, you must restore the good name of your husband and that of your relative Antonia. Marinella had been a terrible gossip. She spoke calumnies and detractions against her husband and her relative. God was not pleased with her, and Francis made this perfectly clear. Now, it wasn't until she made restitution and showed mercy to these people 
and corrected the wickedness of her crime, that God answered her prayers, and her daughter was restored to health immediately as promised by St. Francis. Now we were given this lesson to learn mercy and in order to give God more glory. Now Pope Paul II was the Pope during the early years of his order's foundation. Now he had heard of the great works of St. Francis and so he sent a representative from the Vatican named Monsignor Adorno to investigate the order because he wanted to give the papal approval. Now Monsignor Adorno arrived early in the morning. He went into the chapel while Mass was being celebrated and to one side of the chapel he saw a fervent friar in great reverence and deep concentration. He realized that this was Francis. Now after Mass... Francis met with this envoy from Rome in his cell. Now, he lit a fire out of coal and tried to make Monsignor Adorno as comfortable as possible because, of course, St. Francis practiced many austerities. But then the Monsignor began to speak. He said, Brother Francis, I know of your living and the way you want to perpetuate it through your followers and your monasteries. I admire your fortitude. However, I must point out that this extreme form of self-mortification is inconsistent with the demands of human nature. He thought it was too hard, and is therefore condemned by the wisest of men of our age. It is therefore necessary that you soften this excessively rigorous fasting. This is what the Monsignor told St. Francis. Well, the saint listened calmly and attentively, and after a moment of silence, he stood up, he walked over to the fire, he picked up the hot coals in his hands, and turned around and sat down next to the Monsignor. And holding him in his hands, he looked at Monsignor Adorno and said, Yes, it is true, Monsignor, I am an unlearned peasant. And if I were not, I would not be able to do this. Now, what could be the Monsignor's reply to this? Well, St. Francis showed him through this incredible act of faith that God was directing his actions and his religious order. Monsignor Adorno realized by this act that anyone with the grace of God can live a healthy existence even in the face of the most severe penances. In his visit, Monsignor Adorno also learned of all the other miracles of Francis, and these he brought back to the Pope when he made his report. But the Pope wouldn't give the order his papal approval because he thought the penance and fasting were too severe. But then only a few months after the visit, on July 26, 1471, Pope Paul II suddenly died. Now, he was very healthy, but right at this moment, he passed away. Now, he had been in good health, and this was a shock to everyone, but this was the will of God. And so Pope Sixtus IV was elected in his place, and this was by God's design. Since this pope was a Franciscan, he also lived a very austere and penitential life. So he reviewed the constitutions of the minimum friars, and he gave his overwhelming approval. Now, then on March of 1480... King Louis XI, the king who united France into one nation, became the most powerful king in the world, but he suffered a stroke at the height of his power. Now, this stroke paralyzed him and damaged his speech permanently. But being confined to his castle at Tours in central France, he desperately looked for a cure. But his doctors told him that there was no cure for him and that he was going to die. Now, this king, of course, had a tremendous passion for life, and he had an awful fear of death. He was given over to the joys of this world and its pleasures. So his servants, seeing this and seeing his sadness, they brought over dancers, jesters, and all kinds of buffoons to bring him out of his sadness. But this was no use. Now, the king himself ordered prayers, processions, and pilgrimages for his health. Even relics were brought all over from, the, from all over the country for his cure, but nothing worked. But then he was told by one of his servants, John Marome, about Francis and all of his miracles. So immediately, the king sent a message to this holy hermit. But Francis wouldn't go. Even though the king promised to do everything for the order, give him any amount of money, and even establish monasteries in his kingdom. Now, two different messengers were sent to St. Francis, and twice the saint said no. Then the king of France begged his friend, the king of Naples, to intercede for him and to bring the saint to France. But Francis told the king that he would not tempt God or take a voyage of a thousand miles to work a miracle that asked by worldly and merely human motives. So the king of France went to Pope Sixtus IV, and finally Francis agreed 
but under holy obedience. So then Francis set out on his journey to France. He went out with three, of the, uh, three other friars and a donkey that had the name Martinello. Now all the brothers would walk until they got tired, and then they would ride Martinello. Now they had walked for so long that the shoes of Martinello, the donkey, had worn away, and he began to walk with a limp. So they came up to the town of Loria, and there he performed one of his most famous miracles. And this, of course, is recorded. They came down to the blacksmith, and Francis asked him if in the name of Jesus he would shoe Martinello. He agreed, and after this was done, the blacksmith asked for money. Obviously, he hadn't gotten the gist. St. Francis said, Dear brother, I ask this of you in charity, but none of us has the money to pay you. Rest assured that the blessed Jesus will recompense you generously for your act of charity. But the blacksmith replied, He said, I care little for your money. I have served you, and now I want my pay. Francis tried to calm him down, but he only became more and more angry. So the saint said calmly to the donkey, Martinello, this man does not want to be charitable, and we don't have the money to pay him. Give him back his shoes. So Martinello, obeying his master, shook the shoes off his hooves and dropped the four shoes. Now the blacksmith, seeing this, was humiliated and repentant. The blacksmith fell to his knees and begged for forgiveness. He requested the nail of the shoes back on the donkey, but Francis refused. In fact, they went on to the next town where a blacksmith did it out of charity. Now, when Francis finally arrived at the castle in Tours, the king ran out with all his court to greet him, and he fell on his knees and begged him to obtain from God the prolongation of his life. Now, St. Francis had told him that no wise man should have the desire to prolong their life, and that even kings had their appointed time. The saint told him that he had nothing to do but resign himself to God's will and prepare for a happy death. But St. Francis visited him day after day, and he spoke to him with such love and kindness. Now the saint spoke with such wisdom, holiness, and conviction, even though he was a man without learning, that those who heard him were convinced that the Holy Ghost spoke through him. But the king was still worried about France and his kingdom in this world. He thought immediately that Francis would cure him. But this was not Francis' mission. His mission was to prepare the king for his death, not to heal him. So St. Francis would lead him to think of his eternal soul as supernatural life instead of his natural life. He said to the king, He said, Sire, no one on earth can presume to alter the divine will. It is our duty to submit ourselves humbly and prayerfully to his will. O king, I must inform you with deep regret that God will not permit me to cure you. You must put your affairs in order because little time remains for you. The king of France then began preparing himself for death. The words of St. Francis brought about a great change in this king. The king became generous and kind with his people for the sake of pleasing God who died for him. It was the loving kindness that St. Francis showed the king that enabled the king to clearly see how much God loved him. He began showing more and more reverence towards the sacraments and greater joy in receiving them. The king developed a special love for Our Lady, and he became especially attached to her, and he especially honored her on Saturdays, which is her special day. But he asked also for the grace of dying on Saturday in honor of Our Lady. And then on August 30th, 1483, while the king lay in his bed calmly and reverently, he repeated the prayer, Our Lady of Embrun, Dear Mother, pray for me. And then he died. It was a Saturday. Now, why is this considered a great miracle? Because it takes a greater miracle to raise a dead soul to life than to raise a body. And we know from the last sermon that St. Francis raised many bodies to life. And St. Francis did just that, raise a soul, just like our blessed Lord. If we recall the words of our Lord who said, When he cured the lame man, he said, Which is it easier to say, Arise and walk, or your sins are forgiven? The only reason that we're here in this world is for the sake of our eternal soul and to prepare for our supernatural life. Today, in these days of crisis in our church, we have lost the sense of the supernatural. We need to restore that understanding. So we need to hear about great saints like this. 
So if you want to read more about this great saint, St. Francis of Piola, there, there is a book available by Tan Books on the life of the saint. Now, I've given you very, very few of his miracles, but just enough to understand what this great saint was about. But God raised this miracle worker to strengthen a collapsing world, weakened by a crisis of faith in the church. His example is just as necessary now as it was in his day. St. Francis' example helps us to strengthen our faith in these wicked times of perversion and apostasy in order to show us the power of the omnipotent and almighty God at the hands of a humble servant. His life is proof of the gospel that if we had the faith of a mustard seed, we could move mountains. Now we are living in a world on the verge of total collapse. God loves us and he will never abandon us. He is calling up saints in this time of crisis. He is calling up men and women who love him and who are unafraid of preaching the truth to the world, whether by word, work, or example. He is calling up saints like St. Francis. Will you be one of them? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.